and here we go. Hello and welcome to the second episode of For the Love of Improv. We are your hosts, Jesse Wicks and... And I'm Katie Welsh. Today our topic is... Character building, and we have Taylor Reedman here today. Uh, she is a senior improviser at Reno Improv. Uh, she is on two teams, uh, Ghost and We Digress, so uh, you should get down there and see her because she's an amazing performer. Um, she also teaches improv, so you should check that out, and we'll talk to her a little bit more about that. And she also dabbles in a bit of stand-up, too. So, uh, yeah, welcome, Taylor. Hi, thanks for having me, guys. All right, just you know, a few disclaimers to get us started. We are not improv experts. We really believe that you're never going to quite be an expert, but we're all students of improv, and that's why we're here talking today, so you guys can learn and grow with us. Um, Katie, can you tell them what they're going to get from the show today? Yeah, so basically we're, we're going to chat about improv, obviously, and we have uh, some specific questions to ask to discuss with Taylor about character. Um, but we also have some segments involved, so we're going to play a game, which should be interesting, because it might be a little naughty, ha ha ha. <laughs> um, and we also have a history segment that's not boring, I promise. Um, and maybe if we have time, we have a listener's question that we might get to at the end. All Am right. I missing anything? Did no. I miss anything? Okay. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. So to kind of get the juices flowing, we're going to ask Taylor a question. And uh, I think we can answer it too. So Taylor, what was your favorite game growing up as a child? What did you play? Let me that you remember. Oh, my brothers are going to hate me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so my favorite, favorite, favorite game in the world was turning my brothers into sisters. <laughs> That too. Oh God. <laughs> yeah. So it's Michael and Hayes are their real names, and I would turn them into Michelle and Hazel, and I had oh. elaborate costumes for them, and I would create plays for them. And one of my brothers, I, I'll just be nice, and I won't say which one, <laughs> like still sometimes tells me about how much fun it was to wear wear heels. <laughs> he, he was like really into it. That's um. Funny. So I like to see myself as a gender liberator. Yes. <laughs> Let's, let's make it. Let's, let's make it ma- deep. Let's make and, it that. Yeah. No, totally. No. And it, it really didn't actually come from a malicious place. Like no. I, I actually just really enjoyed dressing them up and, yeah. and yeah. making them like trot around the house and perform for my parents. <laughs> Did you have any sisters? No. No. So you, that was really the only people you had to dress mm-hmm. up. <laughs> you made sisters. I right. created them. <laughs> I created them out of seemingly nothing. Yeah, mm. see? And there you go. That's improv. Indeed. Right there. Cool. What was your favorite game, Jess, um, as a kid? I always loved dress up. Uh-huh. So I... Uh, oh, you would have fit right in. I know. Taylor's yeah. ensemble. <laughs> um, I did dress up my brother. He he became Roberta. Oh, really? Sorry, awesome. sorry Robbie. Um, my dad did not like that very much. Um, but... It was mostly, like, of myself. Like, I was that narcissistic kid that was just, like, always kind of, like, daydreaming, looking in the mirror at myself. (laughs) Braiding your hair. Braiding my hair, twirling (laughs) it, uh, pretty dresses. My mom had, my mom was a a cheerleader when she was in her younger days, so she had her old cheerleader outfit I would always get into. (laughs) uh, Yeah, it makes me excited. I kind of want to start playing dress up as an adult now. Yeah, Yeah, totally. What about you, Katie? Um, well, you know, I liked all the typical, I like to dress up and I like to play house and all those typical games, but I was somewhat of an old only child. My brother was 11 years older than me and he was my half brother. So I found myself alone a lot. And so, I mean, I had friends and stuff, but I liked actually spending time with myself (laughs) and, uh, I, you know, I got into like Madonna at an early age and I would dress up like her and like sing my heart out and like, Mm -hmm. you know material yeah. girl and all that, that awesome. and then my mom would walk in and I'd be like so embarrassed because <laughs> I'm like ah, like you know material you know mm-hmm. and then I'd be like oh no I wasn't doing anything <laughs> yeah. I used to like <clears throat> oh my god this is so not good um <laughs> Ooh, please share then <laughs> yes so I used to be I mean I think I'm still really good at this but I'm convincing my friends that going into public as not yourself is a great idea. 
Um, huh. Specifically, when I was little, I used to convince my friend to go into the store and, like, let's pretend like we're both deaf. And so we would, oh my God. <laughs> we would walk around and, like, come up with, like, not real sign language oh and like she'd be on the other side of the aisle and I'd be like basically giving her like baseball signals because I used to play baseball too oh my god and like oh, like touching my crotch and like <laughs> fixing my glasses like my fake glasses oh and like god. trying to tell her like yeah get the suit like whatever oh or yeah and oh, oh I just god, had so much fun doing that I bet. and I then know. also imitating dads I've always been a dad imitator oh my like, god in public, can you give us an impression right now not to put you on the spot oh, but yeah. I'm gonna put you on the spot yeah <laughs> no, that's totally fine um so this is dad who is angry at his child at the swimming pool okay hey I don't want to be that I told you not to do that Public place. Public face. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I've never heard I that. I love that there's like, there's like, a, you know, like the dads that like just have like sayings or they're mm-hmm. not like complete sentences. They, they speak in like, like taglines or in something. In taglines. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, I don't know what that is. Public place. Public place. Public, public face. Is that, now is that based, not to get too personal, but is that based on your father or is it just oh, kind of like a generic dad that... That, that dude... I specifically remember I was at, like, this country club that I my family did not attend, but I was, like, a plus one for right. one of my rich friends. Yeah. And um, there was this guy, and he was, like, getting angry at his kid, and I just could not handle, like, how he was talking to his kid, but it was so fascinating to me. Yeah. And I was probably, I think I was 12 years old. Uh-huh. And mm-hmm. I heard him, like, talking to his little kid, like, you just, and it was just, like, in his throat, uh-huh. and just trying to not be angry in public. <laughs> You know? <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, take care of your, your, your kid. Like, and he heard me do that, and he was like, that's not appropriate for you to do. And in my oh, head, no, was, so he spoke to you because he heard you imitating mm-hmm. him? Oh, my God. That's yeah, so it was funny. so embarrassing, but at the, I didn't even realize that I was doing it. Uh-huh. Because he said, I don't remember exactly what he said to his kid, but I said the exact same thing right after in the same voice. And right. It's funny to me because I think you said it annoyed you. Like it just, it kind of, I don't know if disturb is too strong a word, but you were kind of like, don't talk to your kid that way. Right. And so I think it's funny that you kind of like turned it into like, oh, something sort of entertaining or funny. And then, Mm -hmm. (laughs) because I got to think that that's, that's where I draw a lot of like my comedy or or improv stuff too, where it's like, you know, turning those things that kind of like, uh, like strike you somehow. And you're Mm -hmm. like, Mm -hmm. You know, and then you make a character out of it or something like that. Yeah, you know? it's yeah. just whatever. Is, it's just like that arousal. Mm-hmm. You know, like yeah. I don't know. Sometimes it's totally. anger. Sometimes right it's... doesn't always have to be anger. Yeah, Mm-mm. but it's just oh, something just got triggered. I don't know what it is, but I'm gonna try and dive into that hole and amplify it mm-hmm. because that means I'm connecting to it in some way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. Oh my god, that's perfect segue into our topic too. Yeah. Um. Oh, but first we're gonna we're gonna play a game though, right? First. Um. Well, let's ask. Let's ask. Um. Get. You know, we already kind of did, but let's get to know Taylor just a little bit more. Taylor, can I'm you an open book? <laughs> <laughs> uh, why did you show up to your oh, yeah. very first improv class, lesson, workshop, and why did you keep coming back? Okay. Uh, I think. My very first improv class was actually in college, I'm pretty sure. Um, I've been doing theater my whole life, so it's very possible that I took improv, but not, um, maybe it wasn't called that, Mm -hmm. I don't know, whatever. But the first time I actually remember being in improv class was in college. I One of my degrees is in theater, and so I was super excited because we didn't have like an improv specialization where I went to school, and it was... I don't know, it was so electric, because in all of my other classes, it's, you know, like, literally by the book, like, you have to do by script, and, um, you, as, also, just as a woman, you get typecast, and I'm mm. always, always, always typecast as one of, like, the pretty slash mean girls, <laughs> oh. or, like, but in, in high school, I was, I got to play a lot of, like, the supporting comedic roles, and mm. I love that. Um, and, but through my college experience, like, I wasn't really provided those rules as often. I, suddenly I was typecast as, like, something completely different. as like, this pretty and mean. And I was like, this sucks. Mm. Mm. Um, 
so that class was allowing me to open up and do some characters that I had started to develop in high school when I was able to do more comedic roles and so I was just really in love with being able to step out of my own skin mm -hmm. um, because typecasting is just I mean that's just part of acting in general yeah um, and I think women in general fall into that a lot because mm -hmm. because that's a lot of the roles that get written into things mm -hmm. yeah and yeah. there is some like validity to why that happens like you are playing a role right mm -hmm. that being said like you have to be able to distinguish which one is part of like a cultural like an outdated cultural norm and which one actually is a typecast because it serves the role mm -hmm. like that's where it gets kind of muddied but anyway like where I was going to school it was definitely just based on like who you are mm -hmm. as a person because you're whatever you're in college and right. that's just the way things go so I came back because I love stepping out of my own skin. I'm one of my primary forms of comedy is physical and I like being able to adopt different physicalities and experience the world through a different posture or <laughs> like a different tone of voice and just kind of not be me for a while mm -hmm. and not, I don't, it's not like I hate me, right. but I am limiting. Yeah. You know? Sure, we all are. Yeah. 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 So it's kinda cool to break free from that mm -hmm. and that's just kinda how I fell in love with that sector of acting. I've mm -hmm. been acting my whole life, but improv is definitely like your your real love. Oh yeah. 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 Definitely. That's cool. Yeah. I love awesome. the way you put that because I feel like so many people have different like psychological reasons why they do things and mm -hmm. or in improv why they choose improv and, and just having that moment of not being yourself is just Yeah. You can feel however you want. Yeah, and I, I definitely feel, too, there's, like, a, a common theme with improv, which is which is there's freedom. There's so much freedom into it, in it, you know? I mean, um, obviously, in other forms of acting, there's a certain type of freedom, but you're limited to, like you said, like, the roles and the and the script and all that. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, for sure. I think being, like, trying to not be yourself takes practice. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know because sometimes you forget like how much of yourself you're bringing onto the stage mm. and developing your character work really allows you to put yourself aside and create a character that's actually serving the scene mm -hmm. not a character that's serving your ego yeah because that happens a lot i've seen it on stage i'm definitely have done it <laughs> yeah i think <laughs> we're know? all guilty of that i mean we talked about it in the first episode a little bit about and you took the Rosowski uh, workshop as well. And <laughs> like, since that was the last workshop, I reference him a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, you know, he talks a lot about that. Like you're, you have no business being, like he separates the actor from the, I forget what he calls the person, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Well, the actor from the character. From the character, yeah. And he's just like, don't bring your bullshit on stage, basically, is what he constantly says. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But it's hard to do that if you're yeah. not right, if you're not able to identify your bullshit. Yes, mm -hmm. that's you so know, true. It's, that's really hard. Well, to and do. to me, that's what brings such a therapeutic, because I just feel like it makes you deal with your bullshit. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it really makes you come face to face with it. And mm -hmm. it's like you and I think in the beginning, I know I've been guilty of being like, oh, well, that person. And like, I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. You have to you have like, look at your own bullshit. Don't mm -hmm. worry about other people's bullshit. Right. Like, yeah. let them deal with their bullshit. You know, like you right. find yourself. Oh, I always play high status characters who um, yeah. put themselves in a judging role. So I always play the the teacher telling the kid, the kid that they're not doing well in school, the parent mm -hmm. who's mad at the other parent because the other parent cheated, the older sibling, like whatever it is, like if you always find that, it's like, hmm, why am I like anchored to high status roles? Like what's going on in my real life That's mm -hmm. that maybe I have a high status role or I'm seeking one out in work or I don't know, whatever it is. Sometimes yeah. it's circumstantial, but it's, sometimes it's like more core to your identity. Yeah. Paying attention to why that's happening could it actually like limits your scope on stage mm -hmm. if you if you hold on too much onto who you are. Yeah, and I mean that's totally interesting because when what you just said about sort of more traditional theater and stuff and how we're talking about typecasting and stuff like that. Um, cause that made me think too. It's like, oh, I know I have sometimes a tendency and I know Jess and I have talked about this where it's like I've put myself in some roles that mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't want to be in this role. Yeah. Why am I doing this? Stop mm -hmm. it. Yeah. <laughs> right. And you're just oh, yeah, like, absolutely. why am I stereotyping myself as a right. woman or whatever it might be? Maybe it's just, you know, like certain roles that you gravitate towards and you're like, I want to stop doing that mm -hmm. same thing. 
Yeah. So yeah. I've done that exact same thing where I was complaining about something off stage and then I went on stage and I did it to myself. <laughs> like maybe somewhere in my subconscious it was living and it wanted to come out. But yeah. 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 Um let's play a quick game. We got about two minutes, let's say, cool. for a game. Um do you want to introduce it, Katie? Sure. So um <laughs> so uh last episode I noticed that like I kind of swore a lot, which I don't know. Something about improv too, maybe it's that freedom thing. It just makes me want to say like the F word over and over again. I don't know what it is like if there's no and then sometimes if I come out of like that Rosowski for example workshop or something because I feel like improvers in general Mm -hmm. I don't know if if you guys have it like you you get to it's like a part of the culture almost like people just swear more because it's Mm -hmm. like who cares like we're just gonna do whatever we want I don't know do you guys (laughs) notice that I think I've been noticing it like because comedy is like the everyman's art form yeah Mm -hmm. um it's not highbrow Mm -hmm. you know or you know like it's not gallery centric (laughs) right that's a good way of putting it you know and I think that lends itself well to speaking in layman's terms and speaking and like cussing a lot right like that's just kind of the way that comedy comedy is also I read that um when you cuss it's like a like a physiological reflex just like when you like like your when you hit your funny bone and like you yeah. it jumps or whatever mm-hmm. so it's actually that part of your brain oh so it's actually like a physiological response to a stimulus huh, huh. that's very yeah. interesting. so like i think there's nothing wrong with it but i think there's you also kind of have to be mindful that you're doing it in the same way that you've got to be mindful of something for whatever reason your like arm is twitching yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. you should probably look into it right <laughs> What is wrong with me? So anyways, that's that was just like a kind of a longer way to say that I was inspired because I kind of swore a lot the last episode and I'm like, ooh, we should do a game where we have to come up with alternative words. That'd be fun for swearing. So and then um yeah, so we've added to it by do you wanna explain the other part of it? Yeah, so gonna... essentially the the point of the game is to to express the same concept of what the bad word would say. Um depending on your particular character, because in some situations, your character would never swear, you know, right. maybe your your grandma or something, and you, but you still have to get the same emotion across. Right. Um, and yeah, so basically we're going to just say what the, what the phrase really is, and then... And then- and then we're, and then another like you or me are, are going to give, for example, car- uh, Taylor a character, and then she'll come up with a swear word based on that character. Right. Or and alternative we'll to a square word or whatever. Yeah. Let's call it cursing translation. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yes. Cursing translation. I like, I like it. it. Okay. First one, Taylor. This is for you. Okay. Quit your bitching. Okay. So that's the phrase. And your character is convenience store clerk. <laughs> mm. Okay. Ma'am? I would like to ask you to refrain from giving me uh, too much advice how, of how to do my job. <laughs> I do want to let you know that you are, in fact, right because you are the customer. But please refrain from telling me how to do my job better. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I love it. I love that. That's great. <laughs> that's like an overly polite way. <laughs> I love that was it. so good. Okay, um, so should we do a different one? Yeah. Should we just switch roles and sure. go round and round? Okay. Yeah. So, um, let's it see. makes me nervous. <laughs> so give me the next one because I'm totally gonna. Okay. okay. You're okay. You come up with the the phrase. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so the phrase is tough titties. <laughs> I say that all the time. Okay, and your character is a little league coach. Oh my gosh. Okay. Children? Children? You all can't have the same ball. Yeah, there's only one. There's, there's only one ball. You, you can't all chase after it. You got to go around the bases. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. No. No. Okay, Charlie, go over there. Go over there. Becca? Becca, I want you on first base. Okay. <laughs> oh my god, shoot me in the head. <laughs> That's all I got. Yes. Internal and external dialogue. Guys. Yes, I love it. I love it. Because oftentimes with children, we feel out of control. They, yep. they take all the control. I think, all right. Yeah, I think that was drawn from my own life. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Being that you have two kids, mm-hmm. two small children. Two small They're children. adorable, though. They're quite, quite adorable. <laughs> okay, it's your turn. Okay. 
suck it. Your character is um, the spokesperson for one of those animal adoption commercials. Here <laughs> at Animal Care, we care. And when we see animals like these suffering, we really don't appreciate those that abuse them. And we would like to urge them to go to the highest mountain and think about <laughs> what they have done. <laughs> to donate, please call the number on your screen. <laughs> That's the I love first it. second they're going to say. And think about jumping off of the I know, <laughs> but I had to be <laughs> so good with the, the right. tension was there. Like, you paused you right there. I know, I was really so, pausing. This is what I, I think, uh, sorry to talk about people who are listening to this that may not know, but Casey, he does so well. You know, one of our, our fellow improvisers, um, he just, he, he has those long pauses. Mm -hmm. And like, I had a pause, but it was because I was trying to think about what I was actually going to say. But then it actually worked with comedic timing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I feel like he does that too. And he tell he's told me, he's like, no, I'm just trying to think of what to say. <laughs> I've I'm called like, him out on it a few times, and I don't think he's appreciated that. But... Called him out on, like... Or is Pausing. That... Yeah. 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 But if you have a quirk, it I is mean, to me it works. Grabs. Yeah. I'm going to attack you. I know. I know. We love him dearly. Oh, my goodness. Okay, All right, so cool. That was fun. Let's um jump into a question. Let's do it. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, and a reminder to our listeners, so we're talking about... We've already talked about character a lot, so... Mm -hmm. So, um, these questions relate to that. Um, okay. Taylor, do you like to be the one that determines the character on stage or do you prefer it to be given to you as a gift? Oh, gifts are my favorite. Um, <laughs> I definitely don't have a problem creating it. I love coming on stage and just providing some sort of posture or gesture of some kind and allowing someone to tell me how they're interpreting it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also really amazing when you get on stage and someone pimps you out with something you could have never thought and then you just get to adopt that. It's It feels safe to be something you completely wouldn't have thought of yourself. Yeah, so. that's cool. Yeah, yeah and... Uh... So, and, and, and just to, to, uh, piggyback on that, because I think that this happens probably to everybody, right? You come on stage, you know, you're really good at coming, like you're saying, like just taking your posture, using your voice or whatever to come up with character. Um, so you might have an idea and then somebody gives you a gift. So then like, how, how do you, do you still use, do you just totally drop what you originally thought you were going to do or do you incorporate it or both or? Um, I get rid of my interpretation, but I keep my gesture. Ah, uh, okay. So, for example, like if I come on stage and I'm twiddling my thumbs and my shoulders are hunched over and I ask the person to my left whether or not they have any more crackers, you know, I can still, and then that, maybe that person thinks like, oh, this is a guy who um, is in the library next to me, but I thought I was the guy who, um, I don't know. Is that the ball game yeah, or something? Yeah, something different. Something I can I can remove that context for myself and, and remove the intention, but I can keep everything else that's going along with it mm -hmm. and then double down on the aspects of my gesture that help support what they just said. Mm -hmm. So maybe, it, like, if they call me out as a low-status character, like, oh, no, little brother, whatever, that's a lame example. But then I should probably double down on, like, being smaller. Mm, like, I see. You know, yeah. Rather than, like, um, aggressively getting taller. Because right. that doesn't, I just right. double down on what I've already provided. Got it. Right. So how do you handle it in certain situations? So say that same cracker scenario. You're hunched over, you're, you're twilling your thumbs, and you're at, asking for crackers. And then someone calls you something that you feel is totally unrelated to that gesture. So say maybe you're, like you're the jock that steals my lunch money, you know, like mm -hmm. how, or like he gives me justify? some, some like high status. He's just like, yeah. Oh, King Henry. Right. Or whatever. And I'm, and, <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah. okay. So that is like 
I think what happens is like we have a lot of cognitive dis- dissonance that happens right there where we're just yeah. kind of like does not compute bzz, bzz, bzz. Right. like we're bringing in too much of our association of what reality is mm. so instead just like coming in clean slate and if I'm if I'm talking like this and I'm eating crackers and I'm still doing this with my thumbs and he calls me King Henry I'm like exactly when is the jester getting here and I can still be that <laughs> mm-hmm. which but is now funny, I yeah. have this title right. and now we're like hi King Henry's a dork yeah <laughs> so now we get to see that in a world where we get to see that kind of person right um Almost or or to your point like if oh oh you just called me a bully mm-hmm. right like I could still be like this and maybe I'm a bully but I'm like a verbal bully. Right. I'm yeah. not like a physical ver- bully where like right. I put crackers in people's hair where they're not looking <laughs> or something like that. And then that. that's all that it has to be. So right. I, instead of being like, no, that's not what I provided you being like, okay, what I provided plus what you provided equals something that's never existed before. Mm-hmm. It's just yeah. like a pl- this plus this equals something new. Totally. And I mean, it's like that contrast too that makes it all the more funny. Mm-hmm. Now now we've got this king or whatever, bully or what have you, but but it's funny because you've got these characteristics that don't really match that stereotype or whatever. Yeah. So that's even, even funnier, yeah. And those are the reasons we love improv. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, let's let's move on to one of the segments um, because for time. Uh, how, okay. How about history? Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. So um, I have been reading Improv Nation by. <laughs> I'm terrible with names, so sorry. By uh, Sam Wasson. So if you want to know everything and anything about improv and how it was born and all that, I definitely recommend this book. So um, anyways, I got to the chapter, which is the the juicy chapter, about um, some improvisers that eventually became the first core cast of SNL. Um, So this was around 1974, my birth year, by the way. And so we have names some of you may recognize, such as... So there's kind of like a Canadian faction, too, because back then um, they had Second City in uh, Chicago and I think also San Francisco, and then they opened one in Toronto. So um, some of the first players there were people like Martin Short, um, John Candy, Dan Aykroyd, so they were all from Canada. Um, also, uh, probably people already know this, but Lauren Michaels is also from Canada. So who is the guy who started SNL? He's the producer dude guy. Um, and then other American improvisers, uh, more from like Chicago area, um, Chevy Chase, Bill Murray, John Belushi, Gilda Radner. Um, so anyways, uh, what I like to do with this history segment um, is pull out some quotes from some of the pioneers of improv because improv is pretty young art form. Um, so it only was born, I think, in the 20s, 30s, 30s, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, so so uh, it's pretty it's pretty young. So anyways, so uh, here are some quotes. And what I like to do is pull out these quotes and then we can just like talk about them and you guys can tell me what you think. Um, the first one is from Gilda Radner. Um, and she says, and I quote, I've never let go of my child self, seeing things clean and clear. Like when I was just born, being a child is being impulsive. Knowing hangs you up, you get inhibited. Mm. So, um, and you know, we started, we started this podcast talking about the games that we used to play as a kid. Um, so I don't know. What do you guys think? I mean, do you, do you, do you see that like when you when you first tried improv or you do it now, do you feel like you have are you um cultivating that child within you or is that hard to access? What do you what what is your or is it not even relevant relevant at all to your experience? <laughs> oh yeah. I mean, it is really hard to continue to be a child in your head. Yeah. Um, that sounds like an abstract statement. So let me explain. Um, (laughs) I get it, but yeah. yeah, Like, I mean, (laughs) the child, like nature that she's talking about is to see everything consistently with fresh eyes. The challenge with that is, um, I think you have to set yourself up to do that before you get on stage because we walk around Mm -hmm. carrying subconscious associations with everything, especially when you work with the same group of people for a really long time, you tend to, create habits with one another, create expectations of how someone's Mm -hmm. going to 
talk or react to you on stage, their listening ability, the characters they tend to focus on. There's a lot of inventory that kind of comes when working with a group of people. And so it's hard to combat that sometimes mm -hmm. because when you know it's coming, you know it's coming. Um, and that affects improv usually in a negative way, I would say, wouldn't you say? Sure. Yeah. So so that's the thing. But <clears throat> in in the same breath, like, it is really important to see everything with fresh eyes on stage because that keeps you from having the same six scenes over and over and over again. If you're looking at someone with fresh eyes, even though they came in and said, here, have a seat, we're about to start your doctor's appointment or whatever, like, it's really easy to just, like, bring in all the inventory that's associated with a doctor's appointment and use that to frame what you're seeing instead of actually using your eyes to mm. see and frame what you're, what's experiencing. Um, so putting that away and instead looking at the person and noticing that their eyebrow, like, went up a little bit more than felt normal for a doctor to do. Mm -hmm. And you can, like, lean into that mm -hmm. and say something that pertains to the eyebrow mm -hmm. as opposed to something that pertains to your medical chart. So I hear you saying like, it, it, it's really about being, and I think children do this really well. It's about being in the moment. Oh yeah. It's not about mm -hmm. being in the past or the future or somewhere off in your brain that is not in the here and now. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And I think, I think it really pertains to listening. So have you ever been in that situation where somebody's talking to you and they're like, oh, I had a really hard day. Here's my problem. And in your head, you're like, I have a solution for that problem. And you stop listening to what they say. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like that happens on stage a lot. Like you'll get something that triggers an idea and then you stop listening to what they're actually saying because you're you're ready to pounce on your idea and, and you're just waiting for them to stop talking at that point. Yeah, and you're essentially essentially projecting whatever works for you or what you you know, your frame of reference. Right. You're already is you know, instead of thinking about what the other person is going through or what what they th what they're actually saying. Or, you know? Yeah, letting them finish or or taking like you said that little bit and using that instead of trying to solve the problem, just be in the problem with them and Yeah, you know Jesse, I, I really hear what you're saying. Yeah. Even though I just interrupted you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really easy to think, think, think our way through things, which is why meditation and improv like have so many common mm. factors with mm -hmm. one another. Like that mm. Venn diagram is is mostly just one circle on top of the other circle, mm. in my opinion. Yeah. There's a little That's bit of ohm on the outside of one, and then a little <laughs> bit of, like, fart noises on the other side of the other <laughs> one. But overall, like, it really is the same mind space. Mm -hmm. that you have to be in. Yeah. Um, I think that's why I'm so attracted to improv in addition to being able to liberate myself from my own skin, which mm -hmm. is in its own way is a spiritual concept, um, is to be able to, ha you have to be fully present to see that small gesture and that small gift. Mm -hmm. Cause we get like so hung up in our head, like looking for the gift. Where's the right. cool thing? Where's the interesting right. thing? Yeah. Waiting for someone to tap dance on stage so I can make a joke about that. Mm -hmm. Instead of being like that guy raised his eyebrow just a little bit more than what's normal. Yeah. Like I'm going to jump the fuck onto that right. right now. Well, and that's so interesting because really, I mean, when you think of a gift, you think of somebody, somebody, you know, wrapping something up and intentionally giving it to you. Mm -hmm. But what you're saying is that it's also, um, you know, your job to recognize those gifts and make those things into gifts too, in mm -hmm. a way. Right. And not just be, the receiver, but also like, I don't know. I'm working on this <laughs> in my relationships. Yeah. <laughs> like my boyfriend Chokes. goes, like does the dishes. That's a gift. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I need to thank him for to that and recognize that. that that's a, that's an expression of how he gives his love in the same way. Like that when someone walks on stage mm -hmm. and they might be walking a little hunched over or maybe walking really proudly or, um, look at you twice really, really strangely. Like, there it is. Mm -hmm. That's all you need. Yeah. I think we kind of, I mean, we kind of walk through life like that, thinking that we need some, like, grandiose gestures 
to as a sign when signs are like all around all the time mm. they're just really small and the only mm. way you're going to see them is you're, if you're paying attention right rule of number one of improv pay attention i know pay attention <laughs> well and then it it is i mean the the word they use in meditation and all that too yoga and whatnot is mindfulness right i mean it's about being mindful of not only your actions but also those of others and to to recognize oh he's doing the dishes now it's my job to say hey I see that you're doing that. Thank you for that <laughs> gift. And now you've made it into a gift. He didn't say, hey, check it out. I'm, well, maybe, I don't know. Maybe some yeah. partners do this. <laughs> hey, look, I'm doing the dishes. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know what's really interesting, too, is I've been on stage with people who are very overtly expressing whatever their gift is. Example, they're mm. washing the dishes, okay? Or they're using a mimed golf club, something that feels big, yeah. you know, and I recognize that, but I also recognize that they're like kind of shifting their feet back and forth a lot. And the audience sees that and they probably see that more than you washing the dishes or you playing with your imaginary golf club. So it's this weird moment where if the person's not aware that they're doing that, but the player on stage with them is, it's, you kind of have to call it out. Because that's the interesting thing. The you washing the dishes or playing with the golf club isn't the interesting thing. It's the fact that you're shifting your feet back and forth because your audience is going, that's weird. Why is he doing that? So you don't call it out. Your audience is like, why did they not focus on that? Like, mm -hmm. now that's going to bother me all day. Right. Or they're thinking, oh, that person's nervous on stage. Mm -hmm. And so now they're not paying attention to the scene. So... I mean, that's great advice, too, of just let, now you make it part of the scene. Mm -hmm. And now what you've done, too, is you've brought your you your your audience is like and this. I mean, this works with stand up, too. It's like, oh, my God, they just read my mind. Mm -hmm. That person just read my mind. I was focusing on that. And then they saw it, too. And then now you're all in it together. Now you've brought them into the scene. Yeah. yeah. Case in point, when someone steps on their own word or they're trying to say phlebotomy and they're like flip pot. <laughs> Potomy. And then now just that's what the word is called in this universe. <laughs> right. So everyone who comes Potomy. in has to go flip to potomy and like make the conversation more serious so it can right. heighten the tension. Like yeah. the oh, someone has to get a flip right. potomy or they're gonna die, you know? And so yeah. just like creating that tension more. Tension and also that repetition because now your audience is anticipating every they they just can't wait till you say that word again because it's just so funny. Right. Yeah. Wow, that um that one quote brought out a lot. Um, I know. Uh, and gonna, end of segment. Yeah, we're going to call the <laughs> history segment there. Um, I feel like I want to get to um, our listener question. Yeah, because I think it pertains to a lot about what we were talking about. Mm -hmm. So this question is coming from uh, Bill Zim, who is, uh, he's a regular at Reno Improv. He goes to all the playgrounds. He does stand up there quite frequently. Um, you took classes with him as well, Jess, mm -hmm. right? He was in your okay. class. Uh, he went okay. through level one through three, I believe, right? With mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Thank so, you. um, so yeah. So, uh, our pal Bill, um, so his question basically, I'm kind of paraphrasing, but, um, he's wondering if we, or any of us here have suggestions on how to practice certain initiations. So to, and he uses this word to produce a positive good scene. And so Jess and I were kind of got, got tried to sort of pick apart some of these words like, okay, what does he mean by positive? Um, and we had a brief conversation about it before, before we started this episode. And um, I think we, we sort of discussed that maybe what he was getting at is, um, you know, what are ways that I can initiate a scene that can lift up my partner as opposed to kind of like, uh, it's easy what? to walk into a scene and like tear someone down to, to be like, yeah. I don't like your dress, you know, like as an initiation. And right. then that immediately puts whoever you're in the scene with, like on, most people would get defensive about that. Mm -hmm. So what's a way to positively set up a scene so that both of you kind of have a chance to blossom, I guess. Yeah. How and I think I positive is a weird word because I, like I was said earlier, I was like, yeah, the difference between saying, I don't like your dress. You look like shit versus, um, how come you never get dressed up when we go out to dinner? You know, that's still kind of negative, but now it's given a, a context to the relationship. I think <clears throat> the issue here is like conflict is great. Mm -hmm. Arguing is not. Yeah. 
Those That's are a great way of putting it. Very yeah. different things. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know in your heart of hearts what your intention is when you get up on stage. If you're trying to throw shade on someone to distract from the fact that you don't know what to do on stage, that's a bad place to come up with an initiation from. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to pimp someone out with something, um, I don't really see a problem with saying, like, I don't like your dress. Mm -hmm. If your character is supporting that. Mm -hmm. Because it's also the job of the actor on the other side to recognize that we're talking about your character and not you as the actor. Um, That being said, if you say, I don't like your dress, and the person responds to you like, well, I don't like your dress, um, then you guys have to have that scene now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, to kind of paraphrase what we learned in Rizowski, you've now started a scene where we're a little bit in the weeds and we're... We're still looking to get to the clearing where we can talk about you and me of Mm -hmm. what this is really about. So to your point, Katie, eventually we're going to get to the point that this dress thing is really about how you're not paying attention to me enough. Right. It's like recognizing what the purpose of that line is. The sooner we can get to that clearing between you and me, that's where the real scene is. And so paying attention to the initiation is it getting me closer or is it getting me further away? Right. Are we filling up the room with crap and like nonsensical insults? Mm-hmm. Are we, because insults are a way of detaching you from another person. Mm-hmm. And improv is about connecting with the other person. Mm-hmm. So it's totally fine to start detached. I mean, that happens all the time. As long as you're aware that the goal is to connect at some point. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah. I love that. And I kind of think his question was a little twofold um, because he was talking about. Um, I think the second part of his question was like how to kind of train your brain to kind of just go into that naturally to find that positive place that you can build a scene from. Um, Do you, I mean, I guess he's kind of looking for particular tools that he can kind of build into his brain. I mean, to put it candidly, like if if you constantly find yourself in negative scenes, then you're not allowing yourself to connect with your scene partner. Mm-hmm. Like you're, you're putting up walls and you're not allowing yourself to be vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Um, so allow yourself to be vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think I'm, I might not be the most well-educated person to tell you how to be vulnerable, but if, if you keep finding yourself putting it on that person in an insult or putting it on them to figure out what to do in the scene, that creates a negativity and a lack of trust. Mm-hmm. So... How can you make it personal, like what Katie said? Like, Mm -hmm. I I feel like you're never around anymore. Mm -hmm. Or I feel like your dresses are more important than me now. Right. Right. Or something like that. Like, bring it out. Don't make it a selfish initiation, but bring it there. If it's just like you'd prefer to have lighter, more fun-loving scenes, which is kind of a different question, um, just stay away from pointing things negative about your partner or judging them in any way always seek to be either their friend and or romantic partner um, in a positive light. Romantic partner, they're, they're doing well. <laughs> um, um, childlike things, you know, like keep things lighthearted. Stay away from judging at all because mm-hmm. judging no matter what, you're either going to have to go deep and figure out what's, what's deep beneath, beneath the surface of what's going on. And that's a lot of work. Or you're going to put yourself in a position where you just look like a dick. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, and we talked about a little bit of this about this in the first episode too. And I mean, I think you're touching on it too. It's like, it's like that constant, um, you know, trying to get out of your ego and trying to, we said earlier too, in this episode, you know, separating the actor from the character, you know, separating yourself, you, you know, you dealing with your bullshit <laughs> And, um, you know, it's, it's not, and it's not to say that, you know, that's an easy thing to do. And I think that that's, that's the beauty and also like the hard thing about improv. I don't know for me anyway, it's been where it's like, oh, sometimes I get in that space, like you're saying, like of not judging and just, you know, letting things go and giving gifts and da da da. And then sometimes I find myself like, why isn't this working? And it's like, oh, because my ego is coming up. And I'm getting in that judgy space and I'm trying to control things. Mm -hmm. And, um, so 
I think that's really good advice to kind of think about how, it, and it's not easy to be vulnerable. You know, that's a work in progress, I think, for everybody that that does any sort of acting. And the thing is, vulnerability doesn't have to be like, um, I used to have suicidal thoughts. Right. Like, well, it doesn't, it doesn't have, have to be go like there, that. Yeah. No. Um, a lot of the times, I definitely know women feel this, giving another person a compliment feels vulnerable. Mm. Like, so if you if you are able to go on stage mm. and say like, I think that the bridge of your nose <laughs> is fantastic. Right. Right. It, it's, it's weird to come from a p- place of compliments sometimes mm-hmm. because you have to be secure in yourself to really feel like a compliment feels like worth giving. So well, and also receiving there. too, I think. Oh yeah. Even too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So okay. if you want like a direct tool, I think, feel vulnerable enough to give someone a compliment Mm -hmm. and give a specific compliment. Mm -hmm. So we like, usually we're like, okay, let me go down my, my quick list of compliments. I like your shirt. Blah, blah, like boring. (laughs) Like who cares? You're like, what's something specific? Like, wow, I've never, I've never seen a t-shirt like, or I'm sorry. Like I didn't even know Fleetwood Mac made band t-shirts like that. Yeah. Like give it something specific because if you go, I like your t-shirt, it's like, great. Now I have to figure out, what that t-shirt looks like instead of you just telling me what it looks like. Right. And not only that, now you've, if you say, oh, I didn't even know Fleetwood Mac made concert t-shirts. Now that person has a character or a characteristic about themselves that they can mm-hmm. go, oh, I'm this, it's a gift. Mm-hmm. It's a, it's like, oh, I'm this character now that likes, what, what kind of character likes Fleetwood Mac? You know, totally. they can go off that. You can move from the shirt. Now you guys can mm-hmm. connect over Fleetwood Mac. Now you can maybe have like a little snippet about you guys both had a crush on Stevie Nicks when you were a kid. Yeah, and totally. like you just keep going, and oh, suddenly like this is about you guys now. Right. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that's thank you, you Bill Zim, for that question. Thank that was you, awesome. Bill. Um, okay, so we're moving into our next segment, which is we were doing word of the day, but this is a concept. So the concept of the day today is establishing a platform. Uh, I'm going to read this. It's from SeattleImprovClasses.com. And they have a whole list of concepts. Um, They say, many people want to go straight into trouble. They walk onto stage and start arguing or fighting. We kind of talked about this. (laughs) That's not drama. That's being difficult. They look too upset right from the get-go. So it's better, they say, to build a platform for a scene, start happy with everyone getting along, and kind of um, introduce the problems later. So how I take it is... They're saying establish what normal is for your character before you start introducing all kinds of problems so that people can understand the height um, or lessening of the emotion or the issue or the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, So you're saying like establish your character first before you bring in a a problem or have an idea of how you're going to react to anything that comes at you? Is that... Yeah, so I the way I took it is you're you're establishing a platform so that you can jump off of that platform. Mm-hmm. So this, this reminds me of like the it's just like the basic eight beat story concept. Mm-hmm. So it's um once what upon is that? yeah. So there's eight beats in any story, right? Okay. Um, once upon a time there was a and every day he until then. And then you keep going. Mm -hmm, So mm -hmm. you need a once upon a time, this person, and every day he, until one day, and because of that, and because of that, and because of that, and this is the solution, or this is the conclusion. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. those are like the eight beats. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, So, and it's really difficult to do all of those, and it's not really needed to do those all in one scene, but you certainly want to have like... A starting point. Your starting point of, like, once upon a time, this is who I am. Because it is much funnier to have someone who's, like, delightfully, painfully positive about everything and enthusiastic. And the tension is that there's someone that's just, like, normal, um, that's getting annoyed at how positive this person is. And now it's their goal to kind of, like, bring them down to normal. Not bring them down to negative, Mm -hmm. but bring them down to normal. Mm -hmm. You guys have seen that scene? I think it it was in Friends. Um, and Alec Baldwin plays <sighs> one of Phoebe's, yeah, um, like dates Boyfriends to or the Geller's 35th anniversary party. Yeah. And he's just like, isn't this like the most lovely yeah. taxi you've ever seen? Yes. You know? And he's just crazy. And like, we know Phoebe as like 
being wacky and positive. So we know that she's that normal. That's that's her normal. But to see someone beyond her, this mm-hmm. is like her until one day someone is like more than she can handle. Right. Kind of right, thing. Right. Totally. She also has that uh, sort of underlying bite. She gets, yeah. <laughs> she, she totally has totally. a temper too, yeah. which is really great. Um, that reminded me too, real quick. Sorry. Uh, I just want to say real quick, your eight beat story example also reminded me of the phrase of if this is true, then so is this. Because that's what you're building. You're saying, okay, well, here, once upon a time, there was a little girl who, whatever. Loved chocolate chip cookies. Loved chocolate chip cookies. Okay, so, so if that's true, then, you know, she goes to the bakery every day to get those mm-hmm. damn chocolate chip cookies. And if that's, that's true, true... Then she probably sees the same cashier right. every single day. And they have a relationship now. Yeah. Yeah, So so that's, yeah. Because I've heard that a lot in improv. Mm-hmm. That's a true. really good point because yeah. that's that's a grounding statement mm-hmm. because it yes. keeps you from like going into flight mode of like, I got to think of something clever and yes. funny. And instead you can ground yourself and say, well, if this is true and this is true, which is a way of keeping track of your inventory, yep. Um, then what else can I add to that? It's, it's right. kind of a fun way of doing the yes and. That's really mm-hmm. what it is. Yep. Absolutely. Cool. Um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, so they said it's like, we're going to move on. We have about... Uh, <laughs> Never mind. I had an idea that I'm a bandit. We have time okay. for about maybe one or two questions, depending on how much we talk. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you ever reuse characters? I have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or variations of that character. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've not named any of them, but I certainly have a, like vengeful old woman (laughs) who comes up a lot Mm -hmm. um and her core motivation is getting back for her lack of being able to stand up for herself for Mm. her whole life so she comes up a lot um I also have like this kind of like a quirky timid man boy that happens a lot. Can I we, can love... we, I really want to hear the man boy. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think some variations of it. I think we need to hear the man boy. I, I just don't know. I just don't know how to use the Monopoly anymore. Because I used to play it with my girlfriend. Yes, I had a girlfriend. <laughs> so mean to me. So... <laughs> It's just like switch out of it. So I I think of this person as like a man who just like like physically grew too tall before he was able to mature. Uh And I love those people Mm -hmm. that feel they look like they don't match their body. Their soul is still a child. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and they probably didn't lose their virginity until yesterday. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. And it's just they're stuck onto a lot of like childhood immaturity and mm-hmm. I think that's really fun. Yeah. Cool. Um one one last question. Um when you're building characters on stage, do you prefer to build it from a place of physical characteristics and accents and stuff like that? Or do you prefer to build it from a place of point of view emotion first? I'm really physically driven. Mm-hmm. So it's it's really fun for me to build my like character architecture in a way mm-hmm. and then allow my emotions and my motivation to kind of fill it out. Mm-hmm. Some people work the other way around. I find that if I work the other way around and try to like create my feeling and then build outward, I it just takes me a little bit longer to create a physicality for it, mm. and it might be too much of an internal expression. Yes, I was just gonna say that. I think mm. I run into that. Like I think when I was really at the very beginning doing improv, I was like, "Oh, I'm gonna use what I'm feeling today to like you know," and then I realized at first I was like, "Oh, it's such a release, it's great," and then I so I I, I soon learned that um that 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 made me get a, get in the way of mm-hmm. the scene or the character or whatever you know. It was like I it was there's too much me (laughs) yeah like the way I look at it is like there's there's costume for a reason and we have to remember Mm. that like those are supposed to serve you like even when I'm at work and if I have a lot of creative work to do I'm wearing my overalls that day because Mm -hmm. like there's something associated with me 
with putting on the right uniform for something. Granted, you're not allowed costumes or props on stage, but you are allowed object work and physicality. Right. And that allows me to like fill into what that what that character could be because again, this is theater, and not only is it theater, it's comedic theater, which is bigger and more boisterous and more animated. It's not film acting, which it makes more sense to be more of like a method, internal driven, because you can capture a lot more nuance on film than what's going on on stage, which is which is just far more animated and dynamic. So Right, and you already have, I mean, in film and theater, it's like you have the line, so then it's up to you to fill that line with emotion mm-hmm. or, you know, what have you, yeah. So cool. I love that. Thank you so much, Taylor, for coming on our show. Is there any way that our guests, if they wanted to learn more about you or see one of your shows or in your business life, your your improv life, your acting life, how, how would they find you? Yeah, totally. So I perform regularly Saturday nights at Reno Improv. Uh, you can find me either hosting or dealing with Cashbox or just um, starting a scene with you off stage um, or be, I'll be on stage. That's Saturdays at 8 p.m. Um, I also help teach playgrounds at 6.30, so those are on Saturdays at 6.30. And then if you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is R. that's T-A-Y-J-A-N-E-R. And you can also find my writing, I'm a writer, um, at taylorjwriting.com. And now we are going to ask our last question of the day that we ask every guest at the end of our podcast. Uh, yeah. So Taylor, um, this is really a thoughtful question that I'm actually just trying to think up right now. Um, so what is your favorite fashion statement of any decade? Ooh, I am a big fan of jazzercise thongs. (laughs) Yes! I wish that I could wear them in public. I know, right? With, now with or with not like leggings underneath. With the leggings. I love like the teal. I just saw like a fucking amazing shot of it in Stranger Things 3. Oh my god, yes! yes. I know what you're talking about. She's got like the teal leggings and the purple jazzercise song and I'm like, I And the white socks that are scrunched with the white. I I know. I I love that I loved that that show did like the mall. It's so perfectly the 80s mall because that's what I used to do when I was like 12 is I would go to the mall and it was Mm -hmm. just like brought me back. They did it so well. Yes. But anyways, perfect. cool. So drop your kids off at the mall and forget about them for seven yeah, hours on yeah. a Saturday. See? <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much for being with us, Taylor. We had a great time. And yeah, we'll see you guys. Me. Yeah. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye bye. This has been For the Love of Improv. We want to thank you for tuning in. If you would like to join the conversation, you can find our website at fortheloveofimprov.com. And don't forget that life is a stage. So get out there and perform the hell out of it. Come on, ladies! Love of improv, improv, for the love of improv, improv.